All right, good morning. Can everybody hear me okay? Excellent. So I know the majority of people in the room, but uh, my name is Michael Miedema, and I'm one of the preventive cardiologists here with Minneapolis Heart. And uh, this is the third year in a row that I'm doing kind of a prevention update. And um, really the goal of this talk is kind of three things. One, we're going to review kind of the main studies in cardiovascular prevention over the past year. Uh, number two, we're going to talk about some of the work we're doing within that realm. And then three, we're going to talk about where we're going from here, the things we're going to try and do next. So hopefully it's of some value. We're going to cover three topics, kind of broader topics. So we're going to start with lifestyle behaviors, and then we'll move on to some health factors, blood pressure and cholesterol. We'll end up with some of our recent data on calcium scoring. And we should have plenty of time for questions at the end. I don't think this will take too long. So all the stats I show um, kind of before each topic are from the recent AHA 2017 stats, which I always like when they come out. They're very helpful, I think, and they very, provide a nice overview of kind of what the current status is in the U.S in terms of cardiovascular risk factors and cardiovascular disease. And so their annual updated um, prevalence of Life Simple 7 um, shows that we've gotten better in a lot of things over time. Um, current rates of blood pressure control and cholesterol control in the U.S. are pretty good. Um, cholesterol levels have really come down over the last few decades, and so has blood pressure. And so the people with poor control of those risk factors is pretty low. Um, the area where we have the most room to improve is very clearly healthy diet scores. The ideal healthy diet score is present in less than 1% of Americans. Um, this is by far our biggest um, deficit. And if you look at this globally, it's pretty easy to um, come to the conclusion that a poor diet is the number one cause, the number one contributor to cardiovascular disease in the United States and, and, and globally. So very important. And if you look at the trend recently, it does seem to be getting a little bit better. Um, the rate of a poor quality, or the prevalence of a poor quality diet in the U.S. does seem to be going down but relatively slowly. Um, this is a really hard thing to impact. Um, the changes tend to happen at a policy level and at a culture level, and it's hard to change things at that level. So this has been slow to improve over time. But we do have some recent um, data kind of showing the importance of a healthy diet. And so PREDIMED uh, was the study that came out in 2013 that looked at a Mediterranean-style diet in people who are high risk for cardiovascular disease. So the intervention was either olive oil, and they gave them a quart a week, um, so a lot of olive oil, or they got a giant bowl of nuts and seeds every day to eat from. Um, so it's basically increasing their monounsaturated fats and their polyunsaturated fats. Um, and the study was set. It was one of the few dietary studies that actually prevented cardiovascular events. And so they also did a follow-up trial, which I thought was interesting. Um, they took about a third of their cohort, or a third of their um, trial group, and they did cognitive function testing on them to see if the Mediterranean diet affected their cognitive function. And the results were pretty impressive. So there's multiple different ways you can measure cognition, um, rather simple memory testing or frontal cognition, which is more of kind of um, a higher level of planning and then global assessment of cognitive function. And if you'll note, the control group here uh, went down with time. They universally had a decline in their cognitive function. And that's kind of humbling and quite sobering, um, but this has been seen in other studies as well. If you follow cognitive function over time, once you get to middle age, it starts to go down. And so when our people on statins come in and say, you know, my memory isn't as good as it was five years ago, I think it's maybe the statin. Probably not. Uh, unfortunately, this is something that goes down with time. If you look at the intervention group, um, clearly they seem to do better. Um, I wouldn't say they necessarily improved, but they at least maintain their current level of cognitive function. Um, so here we have a dietary intervention that really improved cognitive function over time compared to people who weren't on that diet. So pretty impressive results. This lends more credence to this Mediterranean-style diet, which I think clearly is the one that's winning uh, over the last decade. We have more and more data showing that that's probably the way we should be eating. So. Uh, my friend Erin Mikos is a, a researcher at Hopkins, and she does a lot of research with calcium and vitamin D, and I thought this one was interesting. Um, this is some data from Mesa that she published earlier this year, and she looked at calcium intake, um, and she looked at it according to diet, but then she also looked at it according to supplement use. So she looked at people that had a higher amount of calcium in their diet um, from food, and then she looked at people that had a higher amount of calcium from taking supplements. And the results uh, were quite different compared to each other. 
So that you can focus just on this model too here, which is the fully or the multivariable adjusted model. Um, as their calcium intake increased, especially once you got to these top two quartiles, their risk of having any plaque in their arteries decreased. So people had more calcium in their diet through natural means, so mainly vegetables and vitamin D uh, fortified dairy, uh, had less were less likely to have any plaque in their arteries. But when we looked at it by calcium supplementation, there actually was an increased risk. And a few of the other studies that hinted at this, I think the overall data would say that calcium supplements probably don't increase your risk for coronary calcium, but they definitely don't do anything to improve it. Whereas people who got it more naturally through vegetables and other foods um, seem to decrease the risk of having plaque in their arteries. So just another um, vote towards eating real food as opposed to taking it via supplement. And uh, this group here, this was just recently published. And this is the group I worked with when I was out in Boston. We should have thought of this while I was there because I really like this study. Um, this is data from the, um, oh, sorry, wrong trial, different trial. That's coming next. So this is a different one, sorry. Um, this is, uh, we finally have some randomized data for vitamin D in cardiovascular disease. Um, we've had a lot of observational studies with vitamin D, all of which seem to suggest that people with low vitamin D levels do worse. And so leading to the potential that taking vitamin D could help reduce their risk in some way, shape, or form. And so this is a trial looking at high-dose vitamin D supplementation to prevent cardiovascular events. And so this was done out in New Zealand. And basically after four years of high-dose vitamin D, um, they had about 200,000 IUs the first month and then 100,000 after that, um, there was no change in cardiovascular event rates. This is a pretty broad population. Some people had known cardiovascular disease, some people didn't. Some people were high risk, some people weren't. So it was fairly generalizable. Uh, but high dose vitamin D supplementation over four years didn't do anything to change their cardiovascular event rate, unfortunately. Now there's a larger, much broader trial going on right now called VITAL uh, out of Brigham and Women's. And that is looking at um, longer term use in a broader population with a much higher sample size. And so that should be out in the next couple of years. And I think they'll provide some more information on vitamin D. Now this is the trial I was talking about earlier, sorry. Um, this is Mike Gaziano and his group, and they did the Physician's Health Study 2, which was a really large multivitamin uh, randomized trial. Uh, and so frequently we have patients, when we talk about supplement use, you know, I say, boy, the evidence doesn't seem to really be there. It seems to be better to eat real food. And they often say, well, I don't have the perfect diet, so I take the multivitamin to kind of fill in the gaps. Um, that's frequently feedback that we get from patients on why they take them. And so they went back to their randomized trial, and they looked at, does their baseline dietary status affect whether or not they benefit from the multivitamin? Meaning, do the people that have the poor diet actually benefit from it, whereas the people that have the good diet don't benefit from it? That was kind of the theory going in. And so they have just under 15,000 people um, randomized to two groups. One group got the multivitamin, the other group got a sugar pill. And there's lots of different ways they looked at this. Um, there's a couple different healthy eating scores that they used. Uh, but basically, if you follow the p-values here, um, there was no interaction at all. Um, the people with the poor diet weren't any more likely to benefit from the multivitamin um, than the people with the better diet. It didn't work in any of the subgroups. Um, and so I think the take home is that you have to have a really poor diet in order to get deficient in some of these micronutrients. You have to be a pirate on a ship with no fruit for a year in order to get deficient. Living in the U.S., it's pretty hard to get deficient. And so again, just another take home that um, more, li more likely than not, um, the best way to go about it is to actually eat real food. And so there was a commentary on that trial that Linda Van Horn uh, wrote, which kind of really brought home that point. It's really well written. It talks about how we have all this data that a healthy diet is really important and that what we eat really matters. We have all this data that stuff we use doesn't seem to do the same things as a real diet. And so as a country, we spend $12 billion a year on supplements. Um, it'd probably be better to use that money towards something else at this point and work on eating real food. And so Linda um, has partnered with us. And after we did this study a couple years ago looking at fruits and vegetables and cardia and showed that there was people who ate more fruits and vegetables were less likely to have plaque in their arteries, um, we started looking at some other dietary factors within cardia to see what correlates uh, with the prevalence of plaque. And so an abstract that we just presented um, showed that um, there's several different dietary factors that actually do matter. Um, so this is a, an abstract form, so we're working on the paper right now. But this is basically associations of different cardiac factors with the prevalence of calcium 25 years later. And so this one right here, if we look at butter, so the main things we focused on were saturated fats and salt and sugar, the things that notoriously are tied to um, poor cardiovascular health. If we look at butter, um, there were some hints that it might even be protective, and there was no signal at all that people who had more butter in their diet were more likely to have plaque 25 years later. It seemed to be borderline protective, if anything. Um, whereas if we look at the worst dietary factor associated with plaque in cardia, it's sugar-sweetened beverages. Um, this one had by far the highest association um, with the prevalence of plaque at 25 years. And then they actually looked at, we looked at 25-year risk of cardiovascular events, actually heart events, and that same risk was there, about a 20% increase people who consume more sugar-sweetened beverages compared to people who didn't. 
Um, and with sodium, we saw a similar 20% uh, increase. And so this really kind of comes back to this idea that processed foods, things that have a lot of added salt and a lot of added sugar, probably should be our number one culprit. Those are the things we should be targeting the most in terms of improving our diet. Um, whereas things that have been around for a while, like butter, probably aren't as important to go after. Um, so we'll see where this paper goes, but I, I'm excited about this. So on to smoking. And if you look at the rates of smoking in the U.S., um, they're clearly declining. Uh, we're at a rate now of about 16 to 17% across the U.S. Of, of current adult smokers. That's a big decrease over time. However, if you look at it by states, um, it's a pretty wide variation. Uh, we still have some states in this country where almost 30% of adults smoke. Um, so we still have work to do in terms of smoking cessation in the U.S. And if you look at advancements in smoking cessation, it's been a little stagnant recently. Um, we had Chantix, we've had a few other things, but really we haven't gotten a lot better at getting people to quit smoking. And so Andrew Bush is a psychiatrist, um, and he's at Brown University, and he's been looking at new models and new methods to try and get people to quit smoking. And two of the things that have really come out of that are that um, depression and psycho and uh, mental health really plays a large role in this. If you're depressed after your heart attack, you're much less likely to quit smoking. This is the study here where he thought if you didn't have depressive symptoms, your odds of quitting smoking were much, much better. Um, and so he's worked on some different methods to try and improve um, smoking cessation through improving mental health. And he's also looked at part of it as accountability, where a lot of the smoking cessation trials or smoking cessation interventions happen either in an inpatient setting where they're about to head out the door and we say, you should really quit smoking, and then they leave and we never see them again. Or they follow up at six months or six weeks or two or three months later, and that's when we intervene while they're already back to smoking again. And so he's looking at a program where you start as an inpatient and transition it to an outpatient. And he did a small pilot trial out at Brown um, that showed some success. And so he applied for an NIH grant, and he got a fully funded, large randomized trial to look at this intervention, uh, multi-million dollar funding. And the reason I bring this up is that he and his wife recently had a baby, and they're a little overwhelmed. They want to be closer to family, so they moved to St. Paul. And so. He has joined Hennepin County and their research staff. Um, but he needs a place to carry out this trial, and so he's going to do it through us. Um, so we partnered with him. I'm going to be the site PI. And hopefully by the end of the year, um, we're going to be doing a multi-center multi randomized trial looking at this smoking cessation intervention. Um, and we should be the leading enroller. Um, so this is very exciting. I'm curious to see how this goes. Um, but all the data he has so far shows that this method really has some potential to really help. Um, another lifestyle thing that we don't probably pay enough attention to is exercise and cardiac rehab. And um, it, there's a recent meta-analysis in Jack looking at the potential impact of cardiac rehab, um, looking at all the different studies that have been published, and there have been quite a few. And so if you add all these studies together, the two main outcomes they found, that if you look at cardiovascular mortality and the people that fully participate in cardiac rehab, um, you get about a 25% reduction in cardiovascular mortality in the people who go through cardiac rehab. Now, there's potential for selection bias here because people who can complete rehab it's going to be people different than people who can't, but even after adjusting for multiple confounders, they still found that 25% reduction. So it really seems to have the potential to impact our patients. And just importantly, if you look at hospitalizations, um, the rate of hospitalization in people undergoing cardiac rehab is definitely lower, significantly lower, about 20% lower in people who are undergoing rehab. And so in the area of value-based medicine and bundled payments, um, these readmissions have potential to impact us pretty negatively. And so the better rehab program that we have, um, the more likely people are to stay out of the hospital. And we don't have a rehab program currently, but uh, that's what we're working on changing. Um, we've been working with Interlude, which is a rehab service that's connected to West Health, and they have space, and they have space that they want to devote to something like this. And so we've been partnering with them and meeting with them, and hopefully by the end of the year we should have a phase two cardiac rehab program. So this would be your traditional phase two rehab. So this is post-cabbage, post-PCI, post-MI, heart failure, uh, valve surgery. All those things would potentially qualify for phase two rehab. And under the Affordable Care Act, if it persists, um, uh, rehab and reimbursement went up. It went up quite a bit. Um, not hugely profitable, but it makes it much more sustainable. And so uh, for a group our size, we should have a rehab program. And so hopefully this moves forward, and I think it will, and we should be ready to have patients enroll by the end of the year. And then more broadly speaking, across the U.S., there really has been a movement toward wellness programs, where we have these very classic and very straightforward qualifications for phase two rehab. We have a lot of other people that could benefit from rehab. There's a lot of people that we could send to a wellness program. And so we're meeting with the YMCA and working on partnering with them to create more of a phase three wellness program where any patient that you see in clinic that you think could use some rehab, um, you can send them to. Um, and reimbursement's going to be a little different, and that's a, a little bit of a different category. Uh, but still, there's a lot of groups across the country that are moving towards that. There's a lot of momentum towards that. And so I think that's something we should be working on as well. All right, on to some of the risk factors. We'll start with cholesterol. And as I mentioned before, these numbers are really getting better across the country and getting better over time. 
look at the total cholesterol levels in the U.S. from the 1980s to now, they're then down by about 10 or 15 points. At a population level, that's a huge impact. That's a really big drop. This is probably due to dietary changes and a few other things, uh, but this really potentially can impact event rate. And so we have um, a couple new trials of new interventions in the kind of modern era. First one I'm going to talk about is Fourier, which was the big PCSP9 trial that just came out at ACC. And this is really our first trial looking at cardiovascular outcomes with the PCSP9 inhibitors. We have lots of data that they lower LDL. That's very clear. We have lots of data that they're safe in the short term. We don't have much beyond that. And so this is our first trial to look at cardiovascular events. And so this was a large trial, over 27,000 patients. Uh, when Dr. Harrington a couple weeks ago was talking about the cost of trials, they are very, very expensive trials. Um, and so average age was 62. You had to have cardiovascular disease to get in the trial. You also had to have one additional risk factor, age level or diabetes, something else to make you high risk. They wanted event rates as high as they could possibly get them, understandably so. 70% um, were on a high intensity statin, and 30% were on a moderate intensity statin. So you had to be on good statin therapy in order to get in the trial. So this was not in place of statin therapy. This was in addition to it. LDL levels going uh, at baseline were 92. So these are people who were relatively well treated but remained high risk um, due to other risk factors. And they're on pretty good medical therapy as well. So LDL levels came down a lot. <laughs> Their average LDL in the trial was down around 30 in the treated group. Um, so we keep going lower with all these studies. They got down to 30. The baseline again was around 90. And importantly, the effect was durable. They stayed down around 30. We're going to come back to that. Um, when they looked at event rates, they had a significant reduction in cardiovascular disease. Their primary endpoint was death from cardiovascular disease, MI or stroke. Pretty straightforward endpoint. Um, and they got about a 15% reduction in cardiovascular events. In some of the kind of post hoc secondary analysis from the smaller trials, there was a suggestion that the impact was higher than this. So I think people were a little bit disappointed. They were hoping to have a bigger event reduction. Um, but nonetheless, 15%, very clearly significant. Um, so definite evidence of benefit. With the cost of the medication and this event reduction, the numbers needed to treat and cost effectiveness analysis are going to be a little murky. Um, we're going to need to treat a fair amount of people at a pretty high cost to prevent one event. That being said, very clearly there's benefit. And so I think we're at this point, we're probably just going to have to individualize it for each patient. If you have a patient who's clearly high risk, who's having recurrent events and their LDL isn't that well treated, I think it's a very reasonable option at this point. I don't know if every single patient we have with cardiovascular disease should necessarily be on these. I think we have to find the middle, middle ground. If you look at adverse events in this trial, I'm always surprised by this. 77% had an adverse event during the trial, during the four years. Stuff happened. Um, and 25% were serious. But if you look at the rates of adverse events between the two groups, there was no difference. There were no muscle issues. There was no kidney damage. Uh, there was no allergic reactions, importantly. Um, injection site reactions were just slightly more prevalent at 2% compared to 1.6%. Um, so um, really, overall, it seems to be quite a safe medication at this point. And cognitive functioning, or cognitive functioning um, seemed to be similar as well. Um, that concern has been raised in the past, but in this trial seemed to be not a big issue. So the other trial that came out at the same time um, was Pfizer's PCSK9. The previous one was Rapatha, that was Amgen. This is Pfizer's uh, Bubasuzumab. And it was actually stopped prematurely based on data from their other SPIRE trials. So the other SPIRE trials looked at LDL lowering and safety and things like that. And in their analysis, they started to see that LDL levels were coming up over time. And if they looked at that, there seemed to be more injection site reactions. And so they actually decided to stop the trial without looking at the data um, based on some of those other findings that they had. And the big difference here is that Repatha is a fully human monoclonal antibody. Uh, this one is a humanized monoclonal antibody. And so it's got some other parts in it. And uh, what they found is that there seem to be more injection site reactions over time and seem to be more antibodies over time. And with those antibodies, um, you seem to lose the impact of LDL lowering. And so if they looked at the distribution of LDL lowering, this is actually from their, after they stopped the trial, they did the analysis, and this is what they found. You know, for about two-thirds of the people, they got a nice 60% um, reduction in LDL. But in about a third of people, the LDL lowering really decreased over time. And some people, they started to lose the effect completely. Um, and so this is kind of allergic reaction that they basically were forming antibodies to the medication, and they were losing the benefit of the medication. And so they abandoned um, proceeding with this, which is unfortunate. Um, but it's most likely due to the fact that it wasn't a fully human antibody. And so we'll probably just have the two PCSK9s for now, Repatha and uh, Proyunch. And so this is a trial that came out last year, actually, but I hadn't given this talk yet. And so I wanted to include it just because I think it's fascinating stuff. Um, this was looking at Repatha again, this is an ambulance trial, in people with statin intolerance. And so they wanted to find people who are statin intolerant 
And so in order to do that, you had to be intolerant of four statins and including a low-dose approach and kind of the usual stuff. And then they randomized them to um, statin or placebo and then waited a month and then crossed over and did statin placebo the other way. And nobody knew what they were getting. The second part of the trial was to look at if um, the PCS9 actually reduced LDL in those people and very clearly compared to Azedia did. So this part, of these are kind of the final results of the trial. This part, I think we kind of wouldn't be surprised by. That was kind of what was expected. To me, the interesting part is how they define statin intolerance. And so, you know, all these people who are statin intolerant, and to start the trial, half of them get a torvastatin, the other half get a placebo. So when the people that started with a torvastatin, 51% uh, had symptoms on a torvastatin. So half of them seemed to be statin intolerant. The people who started with a sugar pill, 33% had reaction to the sugar pill, but then not by the, or sorry, 35% had reaction to the placebo, but then not by the statin. So a third of the group felt better on the statin than they did on the sugar pill, which is bizarre. Um, and so the difference between the two is about 15%. I think a lot of times when we see people with statin intolerance, we say, um, well, they must have some underlying condition maybe that they don't know about. You know, they have some underlying arthritis or underlying rheumatoid arthritis, something else. Only 10% had symptoms on the statin and the sugar pill. So I think that really doesn't support the fact that this is an underlying condition. It supports more of this nocebo effect where when people assume a negative impact from medication, they're much more likely to have symptoms. And so they ended up with 42% of the people that had symptoms on a torvastatin but not placebo, and that's who went ahead into the trial. But 26% had symptoms on placebo but not the statin. And so the difference is probably the real part is in between here, this 15%. So about 15% of our people with statin intolerance are truly statin intolerance. And so that makes it really hard uh, because we're left with withdrawing a medication that has a real benefit or you're left with giving them something that potentially can cause them symptoms, and we don't have a test to figure out if it's a statin or not. So it seems like the numbers pan out that for every 100 people we give a statin, about 15 to 20 of them are going to come back with some sort of symptom, and only one or two or three of them, it's actually the statin. And so it's a really difficult situation that we're in, and uh, I think this kind of research is really interesting. And so when you look at it by time to event, again, I, I've stared at this a ton because it just can't get to make any sense. Um, so over the first 60 days with the statin and sugar pill, this is the phase A, this is the first group, reactions were exactly the same. This is side effects. And then around two months, all of a sudden, there's a little jump, and the atorvastatin was more likely to have side effects than the placebo. And typically, that's not how I would have thought about this. I think of the reaction occurring relatively quick in the course of the medication. After two months, all of a sudden, these symptoms seem to pop up. Whereas in the second period, the atorvastatin reaction was pretty steady, whereas the placebo group seemed to do better. Um, so again, there's definitely something here. These, some of these people are reacting to the medication, um, but there's a lot more to it than that. Uh, there's a lot more complexity to this. And so it continues to remain a pretty uh, complex subject. So um, another trial that came out about a year ago was HOPE-3. And this was a little bit of a different approach. This is another statin trial. Um, this really looked at treating based on risk. And so in order to get in the trial, you had to have a risk factor. Um, and they had a pretty broad range of risk factor. And these people were in their 60s. So if you put these people into the risk calculator, um, their risk comes out at about 10%. Um, so these were people who would qualify for statin by the newer guidelines. This trial started well before the newer guidelines came out. But these were people with, you know, intermediate to higher risk. And the approach of the trial was quite simple. They simply randomized them to 10 of a or, stat or 10 of brosuvastatin or placebo. And LDL levels were checked at the beginning of the trial to assess risk, but there was no qualification based on LDL levels. They simply were qualified based on their age and a risk factor. You're at elevated risk, we're going to lower your cholesterol. Also, they didn't monitor LDL levels. And the patients were not told that they needed to check their LDL levels. This was very much just a risk-based approach. This medication is going to reduce your risk, take it, and we'll see you later. So it was a very kind of hands-off approach. And what they saw is that LDL levels came down, but they did seem to increase with time. And when they did some post-hoc analysis or some secondary analysis, there did seem to be potentially some issues with adherence, where when patients didn't really know why they were taking the medication and they weren't really sure if they needed it, they didn't quite adhere quite as often. So lend some credence to being a little bit more um, definitive about why we're treating people and following those LD levels to work on maintaining adherence. However, they did see a reduction in events. And so the trial showed a 25% reduction in cardiovascular outcomes. This is mainly MI and stroke and cardiovascular death again. Um, but at an absolute level, that's pretty low. Um, the event rates in this trial, as we've seen in a lot of current trials, were quite low. People who are on pretty good standard therapy um, do well. And so doing additional therapy is pretty marginal benefit. 25% um, is a good reduction, but the absolute reduction was, was quite small. If you looked at MI, you had, again, about a 35% reduction in MI. So it worked really well at reducing MI, but the baseline rate of MI is incredibly low. Um, and this is what we see, again, there's, the rate of MI right now in this country is, is very, very low compared to what it used to be. So it's harder and harder for these interventions to show big benefit because the rates are already pretty low to begin with. 
And this trial actually had a second arm looking at blood pressure control. And it was pretty much the exact same approach. They checked blood pressure, but there was no blood pressure goal and there was no definitive uh, number at which they qualified for the medication. Qualification for the blood pressure pill was largely just based on risk. And so it was a very similar design, and it was hydrocyzide and candesartan. So it was a low-dose combination to lower their blood pressure to try and reduce their risk of events. And they did lower blood pressure, but it didn't go down quite as much as what they thought. Um, they basically had about a five to six millimeter reduction in blood pressure, so relatively small. If you look at like Sprint, for instance, which was the previous big blood pressure trial, they had a 15 millimeter reduction in blood pressure. This was five millimeters, and so not as, or six millimeters, which is not as much as they had hoped, I think. And part of that could be the hydrochlorothiazide. Um, we've had a couple of trials now where hydrochlorothiazide doesn't seem to have the same impact as chlorothalidone. Chlorothalidone seems to have a more potent blood pressure effect than hydrochlorothiazide. And unfortunately, they actually had a negative result. Um, they had a, a potentially a 5% reduction, but not significant in cardiovascular disease outcomes. And so that small change in blood pressure didn't have the impact that we thought it would. If you look at stroke, there was potentially a 20% reduction, but again, not quite significant in the setting of very low event rates again. Um, event rates were very low. This is the same trial basically as before, just looking at a different intervention. And so if you look at subgroup analysis, this is where things get a little bit wonky, and uh, it's hard to explain this. The people who had a blood pressure more than 140 going into the trial um, had a clear reduction. This, these people had a clear benefit from the intervention. The people with more normal blood pressures didn't have the event reduction. And people say, wasn't well, that what you'd expect? Not necessarily. The epi data would say that it's a linear relationship and people with 130 should benefit pretty much just as much as people at 140. And that's what Sprint showed. The people in Sprint who had a blood pressure in their 120s to start benefited just as much as the people who had a blood pressure in the 140s. Wherever they were lowering, it seemed to work. Um, that wasn't the case in this trial. And so now we're left with more controversy. And so as the newer guidelines come out, I think that 140 and above group is going to have pretty clear recommendations. Below that, I don't think we quite know what to do yet. Um, this trial really doesn't, didn't show what a lot of other trials have showed. Um, and so it's going to make it a little bit more complicated. So we've uh, published a couple studies recently looking at, again, implications of these guidelines. And this is some data from Hanu for out of New Ulm. We simply looked at what the impact was of the recent AHA ACC guidelines uh, to see in, in terms of a group that's getting clinical care. A lot of the prior studies were simply in the general population, which is a little bit different than the people who are actually showing up in clinic. And so we wanted to look at the people who were treated at the New Ulm Medical Center, what the implications of these guidelines were. And we found data that was actually pretty similar to what the prior um, NHANES data had showed, where if you look at rates of qualification, and we just go to the all four groups here, if you're young, about 35% of people qualify for a statin. So these are people 40 to 60. Um, about 35% would qualify for a statin by the new guidelines. Whereas if you're 60 to 80, about 85% qualify. So again, largely age-based. Overall rate of qualification was just under 60%. And about two-thirds of those people were on a statin. Um, so about a third of the people who qualify by the new guidelines aren't being treated. And that fits with what national data has shown as well. And that's whether they were old or young. Interestingly, we did find that 30% of low-risk people who are going to a clinic are on a statin, even though they wouldn't qualify by the new guidelines. So there's potential to actually decrease usage in those people as well. So the overall rate of usage might not change that much. And something that we published last week, this is one I got a little bit of media attention, is looking at statin eligibility in our STEMI population. And we've done some work in there before, and we get a lot of feedback from reviewers that, you know, this is a, a numerator without a denominator. This isn't generalizable because you're cherry-picking people with MIs, and so you can't apply it to the general population. And to me, that's kind of the whole point. I mean, the idea of these guidelines is they want to say, we want to treat the people who are most likely to benefit. Well, I don't know who's more likely to benefit than somebody who's destined to have a STEMI in a year. That's exactly the kind of people where we want to see what the impact is. And so I've showed this data before. I'll summarize it pretty briefly. The take-homes that we found were in our STEMI population, the average LDL is quite average. Um, for people who weren't on statin therapy, which is the majority of these people, again, in, in our STEMI database, over 70% of people had no idea they had cardiovascular disease the day before their events. The majority of these STEMIs occur in people without known cardiovascular disease. And the majority of them are not a statin. And in those people, the average LDL was 110. Um, so you'd see this person in clinic, you check their LDL, it's 110. That looks pretty good. I think you'll be okay. Um, and so by LDL, they don't seem to be very high risk. If we look at rates of qualification and we look at the prior ATP3 guidelines, which used LDL to treat, not surprisingly, only 38% would qualify for a statin before their MI. Whereas if we apply the new risk-based guidelines, almost 80% qualify. We see a 100% increase in statin eligibility prior to MI with these newer risk-based guidelines. So if you see them in clinic and use their risk to make the decision, you're much more likely to treat them. And you could say, well, you know, the newer guidelines are more aggressive, so of course they're treating more people. If we look at the general increase in statin eligibility in the general population, it's about 20% with these new guidelines. This is a 100% increase. 
So not only are they treating more people, they're treating more people more effectively because they're really targeting the people who are at higher risk. And so I think this is a real, offers real support for why these risk-based guidelines are so important. Interestingly, kind of as an add-on, we looked at who had actually seen a doctor in the two years prior to their MI. You could write the world's most perfect guideline, but if people don't see their doctor, it's pretty hard to implement it. And we found that about 40% of people, whether they had known cardiovascular disease or not, had seen the doctor prior to their MI. 60% had not. So as we move towards this value-based healthcare, healthcare and trying to implement these guidelines, we also are going to have to do something about the system that we're in, how we get people to actually see their doctor and how we take ownership of them before they have their event. So we've kind of analyzed these guidelines to death, and I thought we're running out of things to do. And just when we're running out, they came up with new guidelines. So we're going to start this all over again. Um, so the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, uh, which is a federally funded agency um, that writes preventive guidelines, recently came out with their version of statin use for primary prevention. Uh, this came out last fall. And not surprisingly, they're a little bit more conservative. They tend to be a pretty conservative group, and they gave relatively conservative recommendations. But I, I kind of like them. Um, they basically said if you're 40 to 75 and you have a risk factor, and your risk is above 10%, so the ACCHA guidance would say 7.5%, they said if your risk is above 10%, you should at least take a moderate intensity statin. Um, so relatively straightforward. They said if your risk is 7 after 10, you can consider it. So pretty similar to the other guidelines, entirely based on risk again. There's no discussion of LDL levels here. They do say if it's above 190, obviously that's the FH group, they kind of leave them out. But no discussion of LDL levels, simply based on risk. Um, they want you to use to treat people with that therapy. And so what we're doing now is looking at an analysis comparing this to the ACCHA one. And we've got the paper done and it's at Jack. And um, it's interesting. Um, the, the difference in that small change in percentage actually has a pretty big population level change. Um, about 17 million Americans would go from eligible to not eligible based on just the switch if you implement these guidelines. So even small changes in risk at a population that will have a pretty big impact. And so hopefully uh, at Jack right now, hopefully they'll take it. But um, it's interesting to see how those small changes can really matter. So we'll wrap up with calcium scoring, um, and we'll have plenty of time for questions. So two years, or three years ago, two years ago when I did this talk, we talked about how we were publishing a paper looking at can you use calcium scoring to decide who should take an aspirin. And last year, we did can you use calcium scoring to take a statin. And so this year, we looked at can we use it to determine how to treat your blood pressure. And so uh, I think we've covered all the risk factors now. There aren't any other ones we can go after. Um, so we published this in circulation. And basically, it's using calcium to assess your risk, decide how to treat your blood pressure. And there's, there's a ton of data in this paper. It's kind of hard to present in PowerPoint form. Um, so we'll just briefly cover a few things. Basically, there's lots of ways we did this analysis, just because with blood pressure, it's more complicated. There's more controversy. And so we looked at a lot of different groups, whether they were eligible for the um, sprint trial and not on blood pressure meds, or eligible for the sprint trial but on blood pressure meds, and a few other ways. Bottom line is that about a third of these people who we're seeing that have higher blood pressure have zero CAC. We know they're a lot lower risk. A third of them have pretty elevated CAC um, with calcium scores over 100, and they're definitely higher risk. And so just a few of the ways we looked at it, um, just look at these event rates here. This is just a very simple analysis of what their event rates were. If you see somebody and their blood pressure is 140 to 160, and they're not on blood pressure therapy, um, the event rates vary pretty wildly based on how much calcium they have. So, you know, 36%, that's a really high event rate. If you're seeing somebody in clinic and they have higher blood pressure and they have a lot of calcium, that's a high-risk person very clearly. There's not a lot of debate on whether or not this person has the potential to benefit from intervening. Um, these are probably the people we want to be most aggressive with. Whereas if they have zero CAC, 7%, that's not low by any means, but that's much lower. Um, you have more wiggle room there, I think. Um, and even if they're on therapy, event rates are pretty similar. Um, these are a higher risk group, obviously, because they've already been treated for some reason. Um, but that range still exists. Um, there's a pretty big discrepancy between the people with a lot of plaque compared to the people that don't have any. And if you look at the people with blood pressures less than 140, and we did some numbers needed to treat analyses here, um, they don't have any plaque in their arteries. Um, the benefit of treatment is pretty low. You have to treat quite a few people. You have to lower blood pressure quite a bit um, in order to have an impact. And we're assuming a 10 millimeter reduction in blood pressure. Whereas if they have plaque there, um, you don't need to treat that many people um, with blood pressure meds to have an impact. And again, the, what we should do with these people is controversial. There is not a uniform agreement. Um, but it should kind of inform our decision making um, if we have that data available. Having plaque in your arteries clearly makes you much higher risk. And that should make us more likely to intervene. And I think. The fact that this paper is in circulation, you know, these are all just estimations. This is all just number crunching with a lot of theories here. Um, this isn't hard data at all. It's pretty hard to say this should definitely impact clinical practice. I think it more goes to the concept of moving towards advanced analytics. I mean, if you look at sports and money ball, I mean, advanced analytics are dominating sports in ways that they hadn't before. Look at a business. People are using their data more and more to make decisions. I think the reason this paper is in circulation, not because of the data is so profound or so striking, it's more this concept that we need to get better at making decisions and we need to base them on data. 
not based on what we think is right or what we've always done or emotion. We need to base them on data. I think that's kind of the key concept here. So um, looking at more data, uh, I've talked about this before here as well, but it's really starting to come to fruition here in the last few months. So when I was at Boston, uh, Mike Laha, who is a researcher out of Boston that a lot of you know, contacted me and said, I know you guys have a lot of patients at MHI that have had calcium scores and you've kept track of them. He said, we're looking at kind of a multi-center um, consortium where we're going to get everybody's data and put it into one group and see what we can do in terms of analyses. And uh, he said, do you think you can get that data? And I said, sure, I can do that. He's like, how long? I said, probably like a month or two. We'll have it all set up. We'll be ready to go. We'll fly through the IRB and we'll, we'll get it done. Well, four years later, um, <laughs> we did get it done, but it took a lot of work and a lot of time. And so he got the other data as well. And now we have um, this calcium consortium. And so we ended up with 66,000 people in the total database, of which we contributed about 20,000. So we're one of the largest contributors. Um, and we have long-term mortality rates, and so we have a lot of different things we can do here. We've already published the rationale and design, and we have a huge age range, again, with tons of numbers, and so we can do all sorts of subgroup analyses. We really have opportunities that no other group has in terms of what they can look at for calcium scoring. Mortality rates vary by the site, not surprisingly. So this is uh, Matt Budoff's data, data at UCLA, and John Rumberger's, and Dan Berman's, and then ours. And this kind of fits with the type of people that are seen in those different populations. So none of this is too surprising. Overall mortality rate is about 5% over 15 years. So we have plenty of people um, with death. So we have a lot of things we can look at. We have cause of death. So if you go to the CDC with somebody who has died they'll, for $5, they'll give you the cause of death. And so we got all those, those in, that information. So about a third have died from cancer and a third have died from cardiovascular disease and a third have died from other things. We have subtypes of CBD death. And so we have CHD death and stroke and other causes. And so. The amount of analyses here are endless. We can do so much with this data. Um, and so we have a lot of things going on now. I was going to show some of it, but it's unpublished yet, so I decided to hold off. We have analyses on gender, which this one is really fascinating, what we found here. I'm taking the lead on the one with young adults. We have about 16,000 people in their 30s and 40s who have had calcium scores. So again, uh, data that we haven't really had access to before, and several other papers that are ongoing. So this is going to build a lot of different uh, papers. I'm really excited about it. I think we can do a lot of things here. Um, so I'm very thankful for the people who, when they started this program, they decided to keep track. Uh, which took a lot of work, uh, but really has come to fruition. This is really going to be helpful, I think, in the long run. So I'll just end with um, kind of a little case presentation. Um, if we look at rates of CBD in the U.S., they clearly are going down. Um, they're going down pretty dramatically, and largely that's because of decreases in CHD. People are having less heart attacks than what they used to. But they still remain pretty high, and so there's still a fair amount of work to do. And so Ron Blankstein is a... Uh, gentleman, a researcher at Brigham, and he recently published uh, an Images in Medicine in the New England Journal just a couple weeks ago, and it's a really great case, and I just wanted to show it. Um, so it was a 42-year-old male who had some high cholesterol, he had a family history, he was a little bit overweight, and over the last four months he noted when he was climbing stairs and doing something, he was getting a weight on his chest. He had exertional chest pressure, and sounded pretty typical for angina. And so he got a stress test, um, and the stress test sheet seemed to show some lateral ischemia here compared to rest. And given his age, they decided to proceed with a CT, and he got the CT, and very clearly showed what appeared to be a critical lesion in the circumflex, higher calcium score, and a lot of soft plaque throughout the vessels. Um, so not too surprising a finding given his history and his symptoms, um, but the person he was seeing was relatively conservative. And they said, you know, let's try medical therapy first, let's see how you do, and we'll go from there. And so they put him on a statin, and they added Zetia to it, and he got some dietary counseling, and he... Um, was encouraged to increase his physical activity, and it actually worked for him. He, he got after it, and so he lost about 20 pounds, became much more physically active, and over a period of about three months, his symptoms resolved. And so he kind of, wasn't really lost the follow-up, but he was asymptomatic, so he kind of left him alone. And about four years later, he had an episode of very atypical chest pain that wasn't anything similar to what he had before, but they said, you know what, let's take a look. Let's see how things look. And so he got a repeat nuke, and it was completely normal. And so out of academic interest, they repeated a CT. And all that plaque he had before was gone. It had completely resolved. And we have patients all the time that ask us, you know, what happens to the plaque? You definitely can see regression, especially of the soft plaque. His calcium score is unchanged. In fact, it might be a little bit higher. So repeating the calcium score wouldn't be any help here. But the amount of soft plaque he had is substantially less. It's pretty much gone. And so that phrase, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, in this case, it's maybe worth a pound of cents. Because <laughs> if you look from here to here, that's a dramatic difference. I mean, that is complete resolution of the plaque. And so, I mean, I would have sent that patient for PCI. Um, I don't think I would have been that conservative. But really, again, as we move towards value-based healthcare, if we're in charge of the resources and we see that 42-year-old, 
I'm not sure that the stent is the right way to go. Um, it potentially is, and if he failed medical therapy, it would be. Um, but the prevention stuff is really important. I mean, to get rid of the plaque like that, and this is anecdotal, it's just one story, but really a pretty impressive impact with medical therapy. So um, what's next in terms of bigger picture? I'm excited that in May, uh, we're going to start the Center for Research and Cardiovascular Prevention at the foundation. And so I'm going to have some dedicated time there. We're going to kind of come up with a team of people who are interested in this sort of thing, and we're going to try and get as much done as we can. And uh, I'm, I'm excited to take part of it. So a little bit of time for questions. If he had had a stent, he would have thought, well, the, um, uh, his solution would be to get a stent, and he would feel better. Right. But going the path that he did, he learned a better way to live as the solution to it, which sounds like a much better uh, long-term strategy, because otherwise we're vulnerable to the McDonald's kind of approach, where you go in quickly, get your, your heart disease taken care of, and then get back to your usual life. Yeah, the short term, uh, or the quick reduction in symptoms potentially can have a negative impact, I think you're right. I, I think it was the Fourier trial that you showed, and my understanding is, is that that was a composite endpoint. Correct. Do you, can you comment on how the breakdown was? Because it, and I haven't read the primary yeah. study. I have to admit I've read some of the commentary on it, but it suggested that a lot of that was driven by sort of biomarker-based MIs, and this is a very expensive drug. Yeah. Um, and I just I, I want to understand if I'm misinterpreting those results. No, you're not. So the reduction was mainly in MI and stroke. Um, cardiovascular death was not affected. And that's been seen in quite a few of the lipid-lowering trials where cardiovascular mortality isn't as profoundly affected as what you'd think. Um, the meta-analyses tend to show that there's a reduction in mortality, but it's pretty small. Um, you're mainly avoiding the events. Um, now, the value of that is that's where it gets a little tricky because for some of them, it's clearly a good thing. Like, I mean, still better not to have an MI. Um, again, and part of it is power. You know, it's just it's, it's hard to die from a heart attack in the U.S. if you're able to participate in trials. Um, people do really well. And so, yeah, it's controversial. Yeah. Um, and that's where I think, you know, to say that everybody with cardiovascular disease, we should just use these right away, I don't think I would say that. I think we really have to kind of pick people based on their overall level of risk. Mike? I think a, an obvious question when I look at all of this is to try to ask you as an expert, how much do you use a risk calculator when you see someone? How, how much would you use a calcium score, which, which has its own prediction and gives you more definitive information? And how much do you use both together? And it's a long answer, I'm sure. Um, well, I think that there's always danger in algorithms. And sometimes people, especially in primary care, I say, well, what's the number? And then I'll treat it that. I think the risk calculators should be the start of the discussion. Like that's where you start. You know, I think. And then from there you go into, all right, what's your story? Where are you at in terms of risk? What are your symptoms? Um, I think for most people that are in that intermediate range, and I, I tend to broaden that out where, you know, if your risk is less than 5%, those people are pretty low risk. The calcium score probably isn't of much utility unless they have a strong family history or something that really is pushing you. Um, if you're in that 5 to 15% range, which is most of the people we see, most middle-aged adults, I think it's going to be pretty helpful when it comes to making decisions about medications. I think that's really the whole point. Uh, you know, uh, we've kind of gotten away from using the term screening. Shouldn't be screening with calcium scores, meaning everybody gets one no matter what. It's more about clinical decision making. You're here and you're not on a statin. I'm wondering if I should take one. That's where the calcium score I think is helpful. You know, you don't need a calcium score to decide if you should stop smoking. We, we know that what the answer to that is already. We more decided to use about aspirin and statins and blood pressure pills. And in most of the middle-aged people we see, I think it can have some utility. So I would say if there's any concerns about risk after checking their risk calculator or their risk score, then I think the calcium score is probably the next best step. That's often, it gives you a surprise result, right? I mean, you're, you're not expecting the numbers that show up uh, when, you, when you do the risk calculation, at least the, uh, the ACC risk calculator. Yeah. Is there a way that we could have that, uh, like a creatinine clearance, if you have the proper variables in place, but can it pop up? in a cardiovascular visit, uh, oh, what's the risk? You yeah, know. so if you hit dot risk in your note currently, it'll pull all in the variables and calculate the risk for you. And it works well most of the time. It does? Yeah. Um, wow. I didn't know that. Yeah, if you hit dot risk, it'll calculate your ACC, HA, 10-year risk. Um, the issue with the risk calculator is that it's based on data from the 1980s. 
and as we showed, those mortality rates have really gone down, CHD rates have gone down, it's going to give you a higher number almost certainly than what the actual risk is. And so this overestimation of risk is really what we're struggling to deal with. Um, and so it would be great if we used Alina and came up with our own risk calculator. We have enough numbers. We just need to do a better job of start keeping track of that. Um, because in modern era, uh, levels of risk are much lower than what they used to be. And so we have issues with overestimation. But in terms of the logistics of it, um, you know, in our prevention clinic, we've gotten the, the person who rooms the patient to calculate it for us. And so it's on our chart right when we walk in. You know, I think there's things we could do in the system that would make it much more easy for us to use. That was fantastic, by the way, Mike. So one thing that I have to do with is when I order a CT scan for a completely different reason, to look at the pulmonary veins, and I end up with a calcium score. And um, I understand the power of zero. You explained it to me before. But how about, um, is it a number? Is it a calcium score of 100, or yeah. is it percentile? I understand you have to go and look back whether the patient's like, you know, yeah. the, what the risk is. But what, what is it more valuable, a number or a percentile, and how do you judge that? So the absolute score is much more predictive than the number percentile. That's pretty clear. Um, the time where I find the age, gender, percentile helpful is in lower scores. You know, so if you have a calcium score of 45 and you're 75 years old and it's, it puts you in the you know, 20th percentile, that's not a big deal. If you're 45 years old, it puts you in the 99th percentile. So in those lower scores, I think it's really helpful. Once you get to a score of 100 or more, um, you're at high risk regardless of what your age, gender, percentile is. Um, and so really the absolute score is most important. I tend to only use the percentile when it's lower scores. What percentile would trigger you to intervene? Because we do these on patients yeah, that are 50. Typically above the 75th, if you're in the top quartile. Um, yeah, and, and that's where, you know, it's a little tricky because if you have a score of 45, that's not associated with a high event rate, regardless of what your age is. But again, if you're a younger age and you're 45 and you're not supposed to be, there's argument for longer term treatment. I mean, you have premature plaque. That's probably the group we want to intervene on. Really great job. Um, <clears throat> there's historically been good data. Uh, I think it was the HOPE trial uh, years ago showing that ACE inhibition uh, in normal tens of patients decreased cardiovascular event rates. Couldn't it just be that the use of candesartan is the wrong choice? Yeah. Uh, well, and hydrochlorothiazide too with right. it. Um, yeah, that's definitely possible. Uh, again, that those results really don't fit with all the prior data. Um, and so whether or not it's the hydrochlorothiazide, whether or not it's the fact they got a pretty small reduction, you know, five millimeters is not as big as what a lot of the other trials have showed, it's hard to say. Um, there is some in the sprint trial when they do some sub-analyses, the people whose diastolic goes really low, um, they seem to have higher event rates. And so potentially you can go too low. Um, and so in healthy people who are not frail who get an ACE inhibitor, like the HOPE trial is people that just recently had an MI or that had known cardiovascular disease, but they weren't super high risk, seem to work pretty well. Um, in the more frail population, there might be some possible harm, possibility of harm. And so, yeah, I don't think we know what to do with that group. Um, but yeah, I think that's a good question. You had uh, presented some data about the Mediterranean diet being effective in reducing cardiovascular events. In the last slide you showed with the anecdotal evidence of the person not getting PCI, is the Mediterranean diet actually being prescribed and utilized, or is there still kind of a fear behind um, no, I don't think there's a lot of any fear. I, I think we're, we're past the point of healthy fats being a concern. I think the saturated fat is where a lot of controversy exists yet. Um, I think most dietitians, if you go to a dietitian around the country, would prescribe, prescribe a Mediterranean-like diet. I think that's kind of where things are headed. There's still a lot of low-fat people out there um, that would say you have to cut all the saturated fat out of your diet, and that's where the controversy is. Um, and that, that part's up for debate. But the Mediterranean-style diet isn't necessarily high in saturated fat, and it's not for the most part. And so um, I think that pendulum's been swinging towards that overall. So, uh, uh, Mike, like a worker, it was uh, very impressive. I, I would tell you there's no Mediterranean diet in Minnesota. I can tell you from personal experience, <laughs> you cannot do that. But, uh, but good question for you on the PCSK9. I know it's mainly used for secondary prevention, but what's the current experience at MHI and how many for primary prevention are you using or if any at all? That's a good question. So we have about 150 people on PCSK9 now. Um, and I would say, just given our biases in terms of who we see in clinic, we have a fair amount of people who are primary prevention because they have FH. And that's really a different group. If you have FH, that's a different group than general primary prevention. And so, um, boy, I don't know what the breakdown would be. Susan, what do you think? The breakdown of what? People who have known cardiovascular disease compared to FH as far as why we're treating them. Well, even though I have the capability of looking at all that, but um, having that at yeah. this point. I would say, at least from my standpoint, it's probably almost 50-50. But again, we're, we're running prevention clinic. We have people that have sent to us. But, yeah. 
as long as I have the microphone. Um, when you were looking at the data with level one and that the LDL was 110 on average, any comments about the HDL? I see that those were distinctively low. Yeah. And that's, well, it was low, but that kind of fit with the theme of most of the people in level one do have risk factors. It just isn't necessarily their LDL. There's a fair amount of high prevalence of low HDL. There's a high prevalence of smoking. There's a high prevalence of hypertension. You know, they're getting to elevate a level of risk some way, shape, or form, um, but most often it's not through the LDL. Mike, could you comment the, uh, on the um, on the recent trial in the New England Journal of Medicine? There was a between 15 and 20 percent event reduction in two two years, if I remember correctly. Um, is that startling? Is it you know are we is it transformational? Are we is this a major new therapy uh, in terms of PCSK9 inhibitors? Yeah. yeah, I think it is a major new therapy. Um, it just in the modern era, um, it's more complicated. You know, I think if we had the MI rates that we had in the 1980s and 1970s, it would be like, wow, we got to get these to as many people as we can. Um, a 15% reduction is great, but your absolute event rate matters. You know, and the absolute event rate is pretty low, and so you end up with having to treat a fair amount of people um, at a pretty high cost to prevent one single event. And from a societal perspective, the durability of that we have to take into question. And so there's people have different takes on that. Some people say I'm the advocate for the patient. And I'm not making policy, and I'm not doing things at a broader level, so I should treat every patient I can for their sake. That's a pretty reasonable argument. Um, the policymakers and the guideline writers, though, do need to factor in the fact that they're very expensive. And so there's a high cost associated with, again, one event reduction. If you look at you know, cardiac rehab, for instance, um, the event reduction was higher with cardiac rehab compared to the PCSK9 inhibitor. You know, where should we devote our resources? I think those are the more complicated questions um, that are harder to answer. At an individual level, I think this is where it comes down to you know, shared decision making with the patient. And you say, here's an intervention. It's going to reduce your risk. Um, it's fairly costly, but you know we can potentially get it covered. What do you think? And some people say, oh, I want to do everything I can to reduce my risk. Then I think you got to fight for it and try and get them on it. Some people say, you know, I think I'm doing better. I've quit smoking. I've lowered these other risk factors. Let's see how it goes. I think holding off is very reasonable as well. I don't think there's a right or wrong answer. With the amount of reduction from the PCSK9 inhibitors in the LDL, should we have expected a larger uh, clinical event rate reduction? No. So, you know, a 60 um, millimeter reduction, or milligram reduction, um, you know, if you think about it, you go from 160 to 100, um, that, if you plot it on the, the CTT trial list, their uh, LDL hypothesis graph, looking at all the other trials, this would actually fit right in there. Um, the problem is, is that some of the postdoc analogies and secondary analogies from the initial trials that looked at cardiovascular events <clears throat> had a 50% reduction in that primary endpoint with this huge wide error bar because it was a small amount of people. But people saw that and said, oh, man, these are going to be real you know, game changers. And this was this more fit with kind of what we'd expect. Great Thank discussion, you. everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Well, sir, how are you?